Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this one-hour webinar hosted by the Educator Preparation Laboratory, an initiative of the Learning Policy Institute and the Bank Street Graduate School of Education. Before we begin, on behalf of our hosts, I'd like to thank a few partners, including the participating institutions from the Preparing Teachers for Deeper Learning Research and the broader network of institutions representing the Ed Prep Lab. I'd also like to let the audience know that this webinar is being recorded and a video recording will be emailed to you in a few days, and the slides are currently available at the link in the chat box. My name is Laverne Srinivasan, and I am the Vice President, National Program, and Program Director, Education at Carnegie Corporation of New York, where I oversee grant making and other activities meant to improve teaching and learning, advance innovative learning design, strengthen pathways to post-secondary success, engage parents and communities, and foster integrated approaches to innovation and learning. We know, given the rapidly growing base of knowledge and technological innovation nationally and globally, that high quality education matters more than ever for individual and societal success. Deeper learning practices are needed to meet the demands of life, work, and citizenship. Practices that really enable students to think critically, solve problems, use knowledge for new purposes, and learn how to learn. Yet, Divisions within our educational systems, exacerbated by school segregation and economic inequality, make it vital that efforts to grow deeper learning practices across schools prioritize equity and adopt a clear social justice orientation. Centered within this challenge for PK-12 schools, leaders, teachers, and teacher educators is the question, how can we build schools that support deeper learning, and how can we prepare candidates to teach for deeper learning? and in so doing, to teach for equity and social justice as well. Today we'll discuss insights from research exploring this question and consider key policy implications and next steps for our work. Our speakers represent research, teacher preparation, and state policy perspectives. To help us envision the practices and policies needed to advance systems for deeper learning, equity, and social justice, we'll first hear from Joel Mehta who will highlight research from the book In Search of Deeper Learning and explore what deeper learning looks like in PK-12 schools across the country. Then Jeannie Oakes of the Learning Policy Institute will present research from preparing teachers for deeper learning, describing the implications for teacher preparation and the need to build partnerships across PK-12 and teacher prep, both to support teacher candidates and build the skills of, of practicing teachers in advancing deeper learning. Following Jeannie's presentation, Sarah Fine from High Tech High Graduate School of Edu Education will drill down and explore the work of implementing the principles of deeper learning in teacher preparation programs, providing a closer look at efforts to bridge the PK-12 and teacher preparation system. Finally, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond will describe the policies needed to support the growth of deeper learning practices across both teacher preparation and PK-12 schools and districts. After hearing these initial remarks, we'll have a discussion with our presenters based on questions submitted through your registration and through the Q&A box. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to engage in discussion, you may click the chat button and type in the chat box at the lower right side of your screen. As I get ready to turn it over to our first speaker, John Mehta, I'll mention that we will include a link to each speaker's biography as we go. That way, we can save a little extra time for discussion at the end. At this time, I'm pleased to, announce, to introduce Jal Mehta, a professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, who, together with Sarah Fine, is a co-author of the book, In Search of Deeper Learning. Great. Uh, thank you, Laverne. Uh, so uh, I'm really glad to be here today to talk about uh, Sarah and my book, uh, In Search of Deeper Learning, The Quest to Remake the American High School. Uh, and I'm particularly looking forward to the um, discussion portion uh, in the latter part of our uh, time together. Um, so Sarah and I um, have spent a lot of time over the last five or six years in uh, 30 different high schools across the United States. And uh, you can see on your screen sort of four of our big picture findings. Um, the first is that um, we had designed a study. We were particularly looking for path-breaking schools, schools that were breaking the mold, schools that were doing deeper learning, 21st century skills, particularly rigorous or engaging forms of traditional instruction. And um, 
despite the fact that we were uh, particularly looking for said schools and such schools had been recommended to us, um, the uh, overall picture was, uh, I should say, sort of spotty. So uh, the bad news was that uh, across the schools we visited, opportunities for deeper learning uh, were present but relatively rare. So to make that more concrete, if we uh, stapled ourselves to uh, a kid and followed them throughout their day, they're still doing a lot of worksheets, they're still doing a lot of low-level tasks, there's still a lot of uh, why am I doing this task, what does it connect to, why is it, um, how can it connect to uh, something that's relevant uh, for me. So uh, if you've met us after year one of our studying, we were fairly depressing people, uh, but in the latter, um, in the latter uh, four or five years of our study, we decided to hone in on the spaces uh, where uh, deeper or more powerful learning was going on. And so there are uh, three points. Uh, deeper instruction classes differed in their stance from most ordinary classes, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, opportunities were unequally distributed by race, class, and track, uh, mirroring the findings of one of our other presenters, Jeannie Oakes, from 1985. Uh, and perhaps kind of most intriguingly, uh, peripheral spaces, uh, electives, and extracurriculars uh, were often more vital and compelling spaces than core classes. So uh, in my short time today, I'm just going to talk briefly about one class uh, in a regular traditional public school. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the periphery and the core. So um, I'm just going to talk about an English class in a traditional high poverty uh, school. Uh, and in this school, the um, the topic under consideration was a ta Coates essay, which had been published in the New York Times. Uh, and the essay was about uh, uses of the N-word. And the argument in the, um, in the New York Times that ta Coates made was uh, that this is not always inappropriate and it depends on the race of the speaker and the context of the situation. This is with uh, 11th grade students in a traditional high poverty school, mostly black and Latino students. And uh, on the first day, they just uh, annotated the text. So they went through it paragraph by paragraph and explored uh, the meaning of, uh, of the argument. Uh, on the second day, uh, they debated uh, the thesis. Uh, kids often, their ability to think and debate is uh, ahead of their ability to write. Uh, and so while their reading was uh, a couple of grade levels behind, hence the need for annotation on day one, uh, their uh, thinking was uh, quite sophisticated, and as you might imagine, they had a lot of perspectives on that question. Uh, and then on the third day, uh, they looked at the, the form of the essay, and so he asked them, um, uh, you've been taught in school that essays should have a hamburger form, you know, where there's uh, a first paragraph and there's a thesis at the end of the first paragraph and the topic sentence of each of the next three paragraphs supports the thesis and then there's a concluding paragraph which restates it. But hey, look at this guy. He's an essayist who was published in the New York Times. There is no thesis or at least not an explicit thesis. So like why did he structure it this way? And then they had to write their own essay on the question uh, and they had to write an accompanying piece explaining the choices that they'd made about form. So in this example, we see um, uh, regular kids in an ordinary public school uh, learning how to uh, essentially become essayists, how to take, an, take a perspective on an important question. You could imagine an extension of this where the work is shared in a blog or a literary magazine or an extension or uh, an exhibition. Um, and you also see a way, you see sort of careful attentiveness to uh, skill building while also uh, pursuing tasks that were relevant uh, to the students. Um, so uh, we picked out a bunch of teachers uh, like this teacher, uh, his name was Kyle, uh, and uh, we tried to understand what they were doing differently. Uh, and we, co we contrast what we call most teachers with what we call whole game teachers. And here we're drawing on David Perkins' notion of the whole game at the junior level. So Dave's point is that uh, when you're learning to play baseball, for example, in Little League, uh, you don't spend one year uh, throwing and one year catching and one year batting and then say, like, when you get to graduate school, you'll get to play an actual game of baseball. Uh, you're playing the whole thing from the beginning, which gives you some sense of how the game fits together, but you're doing it at a junior level, smaller field, uh, shorter games, etc. So when we analyze these teachers who are more, are sort of more compelling, deeper, whole game teachers, uh, they differed in their goal, not to cover the material, but to inspire to become a member of the field, to become an SAS, to be some, become someone who can take uh, who can take positions on important questions. 
uh, they had different pedagogical priorities. They were less worried about sort of getting through the material and more about uh, exploring things uh, in depth. Uh, they often assigned less reading and gave uh, students more time to explore that. Uh, their view of knowledge was less that it had been discovered by Newton and Darwin and the teachers were the sort of middlemen to pass it on, but rather that students could be uh, creators of knowledge, uh, essayists, scientists, mathematicians, which changed the role of student from receiver of knowledge to creator of knowledge. Uh, changed the view of failure, you know, like everywhere we went, there was growth mindset and your next mistake is your first opportunity for learning and all that was all over the walls. But the sort of more implicit message seemed to be there's an answer and you better get it right. But by turning students into producers, uh, people who uh, were making things, it was clear that some degree of uh, failure was necessary to getting to a higher level. Uh, and that also changed the ethos of such classrooms uh, from compliant uh, to purposeful and playful. Um, we saw more of those sorts of uh, attitudes and that stance in peripheral arenas, so uh, debate, theater, arts, uh, sports, etc. Uh, and these arenas had these characteristics that if you take theater for an example, uh, they had a purposeful arc towards a public performance so students could see what they were doing and why. Students had chosen to be there. Students said that what they were taking part of, they felt like part of a community or a family. Um, there was a lot of apprenticeship learning from older kids, and there was this whole game at the junior level. So uh, when Sarah and I looked through our work uh, to try to understand what uh, characterizes the deeper learning experience, we said that it really connects to three core attributes, mastery, identity, and creativity. Mastery, developing knowledge and skill in a domain, identity, becoming more connected to that domain, and creativity, not just uh, taking in uh, knowledge from others, but making things. And so whether you were an actor, an essayist, a scientist, a mathematician, uh, it's sort of moving to this position where you are starting to think of yourself as a producer in that domain and where you sort of move through these three uh, items in the cycle that really uh, gets you going on the spirals of deep learning, not just uh, in school, but in life. And I will leave it there and uh, turn it over to Jeannie. Hello. I'm, I'm going to talk about our LPI work. And at LPI, our focus was um, on what teachers need to learn to make deeper learning experiences, such as the ones Jaws described, routine in classrooms, and particularly to make such classrooms available to all students and particularly to diverse students in schools and communities are, that are generally farthest from such opportunities. We began uh, by identifying these five dimensions. They were on Laverne's uh, screen earlier, drawing on knowledge from the learning sciences, because as Joel said, this is consistent with what uh, we know about how people learn. So these principles are really rooted in the findings of research over the last past century and consistent with the needs of 21st century students. In, some, in short, in deeper learning classrooms, teachers must know how to teach in developmentally grounded and personalized ways. They need to give students experiences in which they contextualize and apply learning to real world problems and how to do these things in productive learning communities and communities uh, in, in, that explicitly address issues of equity and social justice, that, that the two uh, are intertwined. So we work backwards from uh, those deeper learning principles to identify this sort of chain of knowledge and skills as what teachers need to design and execute such learning experiences for students. And then we turn to the most challenging question of all. How can teachers learn these things, especially when they haven't experienced deeper learning themselves in their own K-12 schooling? Many new teachers today, in fact, spent most, if not all, of their schooling under NCLB, an era which only a few students, and mostly elite students, were in deeper learning schools and classrooms. 
So we began to answer these questions uh, by turning to seven programs of teacher education that have organized themselves explicitly to meet the dual challenge of teacher preparation for both deeper learning and for equity. Then we spent a year doing site visits, observing in courses and schools, interviewing both the teacher preparation faculty and educators in schools where candidates do their clinical work. We administered surveys of candidates finishing their programs. We reviewed program documents, evaluation, and every bit of data we could find about the graduates, uh, how long they were staying, how well they were doing. Uh, this book describes what we've learned uh, and the implication for policy. It's a, it's a long book, and I'm going to try to give you just a very few of the top line findings. First, uh, and importantly, um, oh, sorry, I'm advancing my slides. There we go. We learned that such work is being done in geographically and programmatically diverse sets of teacher preparation programs, which is, is really good news. Unlike, I think, what many would expect, these were not all small uh, alternative programs. In fact, we had three of them were private colleges uh, that focused on progressive urban teaching, Alverno in Milwaukee, Bank Street in New York City, and Trinity in San Antonio, Texas. Two were large state universities with multiple pathways preparing hundreds of teachers annually, the Montclair State in Newark and CU Denver in the heart of, of Denver. One was a university school partnership where Stanford and the University of San Francisco uh, embedded innovative residencies in San Francisco Unified School District. And one was an alternative internship pathway developed by a charter school network, High Tech High, that prepared candidates for their network of project-based learning schools. And Sarah will talk a lot about the High Tech High program, but I think what's important for you to understand is that these programs were very different in their surface features, such as their size, the sector, the type of in, uh, institution. However, they shared a deep structure that was shaped by their common understandings of how people learn and their common commitments to a just society that focused them squarely on preparing teachers to teach diverse learners equitably. And these were not hidden agendas. This was the explicit stated purpose of all of these different kinds of programs. I'm trying to move my slide. Mandy, maybe you can help me. Okay. Thank you. Here are the two big findings. <laughs> One is that these seven programs were very successful in preparing teachers who te for, teach for deeper learning in schools that serve diverse groups of students, many in communities of color that are burdened with concentrated poverty. So the first big aha for us is that people really can do this. Uh, this is not impossible. Uh, a second big finding was, um, that the five features of deeper learning that we identified as important for students are as applicable to teacher education as they are to the learning of children and youth. Effective programs teach and support their candidates in the same ways they want candidates to teach and support children, with developmentally grounded and personalized strategies, by giving students experiences in which they contextualize and apply learning to real rural problems, and by embedding their learning in productive learning communities that explicitly focus on issues of equity and social justice. So the, uh, the, that finding, and we started talking about how these programs practice what they teach. So that everything students need for learning, teachers need as well. Can you advance the slide, Mandy? Okay. So here are the types and structures and practices, and I won't go through the detail. Uh, Sarah will give some examples, but uh, each of them is very important. We're quite uh, clear about the vision of learning that they held. Um, this was, they were quite specific. Uh, about what they thought learning consisted of and how it related to social justice. And let me show you one example. 
This is uh, from CU Denver, one of the large publics. Uh, Vision. Um, they adopted the standards of effective pedagogy that came out of uh, Roland Tharp and his colleagues at Creed um, several years earlier in the late 1990s and the early 2000s that really ground teaching and learning in sociocultural learning theory. They've also added a sixth standard called a critical stance that speaks to teaching as an act of social transformation. And if you look at these principles, you can see that they uh, are a, a, a very clear blend of what we know fundamentally about how people learn, but also the role of culture and language and context, uh, and thereby uh, equity and justice as part, uh, as, as integral to the learning theory. So just a quick, next slide please. Um, the coursework in all of these places, uh, regardless of the, these different settings, it was infused with a developmental perspective and augmented by structured opportunities for candidates to actually observe learning and development firsthand in field places. And this is a very strong theme of this integration of the clinical practice with the coursework and the infusion of this vision and this knowledge base across all of them. Uh, the practices, all seven programs did things like they recruited and selected candidates uh, related to their mission. Uh, they weren't shy about who they are and what they stand for. They modeled these deeper learning practices, applied knowledge and practice, collaborated in productive learning communities, uh, gave feedback that supports reflection, uh, used authentic assessments, and importantly, and let's have the last slide here, um, developed these well-designed clinical apprenticeships in partner schools. All of the programs have developed deep partnerships with schools, creating communities of practice that are shared by the practicing faculty, the educators at the school, and the teacher education faculty that this is not uh, a separate and distinct experience. The clinical experience is very integrated. The program faculty also engage, uh, engages members of the school-based learning communities. They engage with the practicing educators in learning the deeper learning practices and building the school's capacity to support deeper learning. And this is really fundamental that uh, the learning was uh, not just for the teacher candidates, but these were real learning communities, the, these partner schools. And finally, by partnering schools with schools in low-income communities and communities of color, which many people were surprised by, the teacher candidates could also create relevant and rigorous deeper learning opportunities that recognize the centrality of language, culture, and identity, as well as content knowledge to learning. They could develop authentic uh, relationships with communities and families. And finally, they learned how to address the harms of poverty and racism without succumbing to deficit thinking and impoverished pedagogy. So I will now turn to Sarah, who will give us an example. Yes, hi, I'm, I'm delighted to join you all. Work uh, and Jeannie and Linda's work. So um, the context, I wanted to very briefly talk about High Tech High's context because it has everything to do with uh, the program that I run and the, the um, work that we're trying to do. And so High Tech High, uh, as Jeannie said, we are not shy about who we are. We are a network of uh, 16 charter schools uh, in, in and around San Diego County. We started 20 years ago. Uh, and our vision is front and center in terms of all of our schools. And so we're interested in uh, using project-based learning as a vehicle uh, for uh, to achieve deeper learning for students from all kinds of backgrounds. We have deliberately integrated schools. Uh, we are deliberately untracked. Um, and we are interested in authentic work, and so all of our projects, we, we support teachers in designing projects that build foundational skills, but also are geared toward uh, students, positioning students as creators of knowledge um, and producers of things that have lasting value to their school communities and to the community beyond. Now, I'm going to try to advance the slide here. 
So um, the thing I want to start talking about, the program I run is actually not the one that Jeannie and Linda studied. Uh, we have a longstanding uh, teacher intern program run through our K-12 schools, but we also have a new uh, pre-service residency uh, program that is run through our graduate school, which I have been um, involved in designing and I'm, I'm directing currently. And so um, the thing I want to dwell on is this, this notion that Joel and I came up with of symmetry. And so symmetry is effectively what, what Jeannie was describing, which is that uh, you need to have the learning for the adults in a given learning environment mirror the values and routines and beliefs that you're hoping to enact for students. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a simple idea, but it's, it's often absent in schools. Uh, we all know that PD is often kind of death by PowerPoint rather than um, learning experiences that are rich uh, and engaging and deep. And so one of the things that High Tech High does uh, for all of its teachers, and we, um, this is sort of a linchpin of the way that any new teacher to our network, including my new pre-service teachers, um, experience uh, what it is we're trying to do, is we have this thing called New Teacher Odyssey um, at, at the beginning of August. So before any new teacher, regardless of how long they've been in practice or not, um, begins to work at our schools, they spend a week doing a project themselves as learners. And so you can see uh, on the, the pictures here, couple of um, photos of our teachers working together and we have some of our veteran teachers in our network facilitate sort of scaled down versions of projects they have done in K-12 classrooms. Uh, and so, for example, we have a group that uh, every year goes down to the border and does um, a very rich, interesting exploration of the, the dynamics um, down right at the border between Mexico and San Diego because it's sort of in our own backyard. Uh, they are constantly being asked to step out of that experience and think about what um, what it has been like for them as learners to experience certain kinds of routines, uh, for example, to work with others, to have to navigate and negotiate and collaborate in groups, um, what does it mean when you're under pressure to produce something that you're then going to exhibit and so on. And so there's a lot of meta moments during that experience, but the important part is that if teachers have not experienced project-based learning or deeper, rich, social justice-oriented learning, even if they aspire to do it, it's very hard to imagine what it would look like. And so by giving them an experience that anchors their understanding, we think that's a very promising place to start uh, in terms of trying to then recreate uh, that kind of experience for their own students. And that runs throughout our whole program, um, my pre-service program, as well as uh, the program that was written up in uh, Jeannie and Linda's book. And so um, just quickly, a couple of the forms of symmetry we seek to do. Um, in our my pre-service program, I'm trying to advance here. There we go. Um, is we very very deliberately engage our pre-service teachers in the kinds of routines and the kind of culture that we hope they can then create in their classrooms, and we name that constantly for them, and we do it over and over again. And so you can see in these slides, for example, on the left hand side we have a chalk talk. Uh, it's you know I'm guessing many teachers out there are familiar with that or a graffiti conversation. Um, if you will, but we spend a lot of time introducing our pre-service teachers to different forms of engaging students in rich thinking um, by having them do it themselves first and then naming and unpacking what it feels like to do that and then tackling questions of, well, what, what would it look like to try to do this in your context? What challenges do you anticipate? How would you set it up? And then we go further than that. We then have them go and do it. And so, for example, in our foundations, course for the beginning of the year, um, this talk talk is one of several core thinking routines that we introduce our candidates to. And they then, um, we then have them plan a lesson in which they use that uh, structure in their own classrooms and then they, they go and do it. Uh, they rehearse it together. So rehearsals for teaching is a core of what, what we think about as important learning. And then they bring back video of doing it and process the experience together, look at the student work. And so we're constantly going through a cycle with them of experiencing it unpacking it, uh, then trying to go do it, and then bringing it back into the classroom, which really breaks down some of that um, boundary that so often exists between schools of education and uh, sites of clinical work um, in teacher education. The culture part's important, too. I have some pictures uh, in the middle and the, um, and the side where um, you can see some of the core cultural routines to our classrooms are, are reflected in our program. And so we begin our, uh, our Thursday coursework every morning with some kind of social emotional check-in or some sort of joyful, playful game. Uh, we end with a circle um, where we appreciate and celebrate each other or a community meeting. Um, and then we, not, we don't just do it. Um, like I said, we name it for students as something that helps to build and sustain the kinds of classroom cultures that we want. And then we have them go think about how to adapt those practices into their own work. 
Um, the last slide here is just something I'd, I'd like to name because if it comes up in conversation, I'd be happy to talk more about it. So there's a, a sort of raging conversation in the academy right now around practice-based teacher education, which is a pretty important development, I think, uh, in teacher ed, moving from talking only about theory uh, in the class in your university space and only about practice in your clinical space to really thinking about uh, rich enactments of practice in, uh, in the teacher ed space and the kind of that permeable boundary I was talking about. But there's this conversation now about how social justice, conversations about what it means to be an equity-focused teacher, often live sort of outside of or separate from those practice-based uh, rehearsals and enactments. And the question is, how do we bring those together? I think most programs are committed both to teaching teachers the tools they need um, and also uh, sort of helping them develop the perspectives and the mindsets they need, including, including mindsets around uh, racial uh, justice and other forms of um, disrupting oppression. Uh, but often in teacher ed, those things uh, stand apart from each other. And so we are trying very hard in our program to, to break down that particular wall. Um, and so we spend a huge amount of time when we are doing our rehearsals for teaching and when we are teaching particular routines, uh, crosswalking to questions of equity and justice and thinking about things like status interventions um, in practice and when you rehearse them and when you do them in your own practice, what does it look like when you are deliberately uh, engaging a, a large range of students in your classroom? What, is, what does it mean to respond to certain kinds of student behaviors in certain ways? And so I wouldn't say we have the answers, but I do think we are um, trying very hard to move in the direction of marrying the goals of equity and social justice with the goals of uh, sort of high cognitive demand teacher, uh, deeper learning for teachers. Um, and I'm guessing Linda may have something to say about that. I will try to follow that uh, wonderful discussion with a question about how we can engage in policy um, to really see this kind of work spread more widely. In the book that Jeannie talked about, we do sort of illustrate across these seven different programs the kinds of practices that Sarah just described at High Tech High. Uh, and these are places that have, in many cases, done this work over a long period of time. Uh, but as Jal mentioned at the start, uh, the practice of uh, teacher education for deeper learning is also fairly rare. Uh, as well as that practice in classrooms. So I'm going to say a few words about the policy issues around this and um, then open it up for the wonderful questions that I see are landing in the chat box right now. Uh, let's see if this will work. Um, there are a number of policy strategies that we can think about uh, when it comes to really um, evolving major change in teacher education. Um, one strategy is how you define high quality practice. Um, that occurs through standards, through performance assessments that essentially ask for teachers to demonstrate certain kinds of practices, and through accreditation of programs. These are not always the strongest vehicles in every state and how they become stronger is one of the questions. If we think about medical education, when it was transformed in 1910 after Abraham Flexner did the big Flexner report of the very sorry state of medical education at that time, uh, the major things that took place had to do with setting standards, uh, establishing uh, accreditation and uh, assessments. Um, and those are very robust functions in some professions, they need to become stronger in education. Another area of policy is how to support improving program quality. Part of that is uh, clinical partnerships because uh, as Sarah just said, you, know, you have to actually experience the deeper learning yourself uh, and the practices around it in order to know how to engage in that. It's very hard to imagine something you've never experienced and then implement it yourself. So clinical practice becomes extremely important. Uh, that may also include things like uh, emerging teacher residencies and grow your own programs. And then we have to have strong attractions to the profession, uh, which means we need, as other countries do, to underwrite educator training so that everyone can afford to be um, part of a high quality program rather than um, the large number of folks who come into teaching without uh, preparation uh, because they can't figure out how to afford to get the preparation. 
Uh, if we think about how could we strengthen and use standards more effectively, there are a number of initiatives that have gone on over a number of years. The Interstate New Teacher Assessment and Support Consortium uh, has set standards for teacher licensing and is about to revisit those uh, standards. And um, National Educational Leadership Preparation Standards are a recent revisiting of old standards that begin to bring in some of these concerns about the nature of the learning experience for students, the cultural relevancy of and competence of educators, uh, the way in which equity is pursued both within the classroom in terms of how students are treated, uh, but also within the school in terms of who gets access to what kinds of curriculum opportunities. Um, those standards are an opportunity to incorporate more of the science of learning and development, which is what the deeper learning practices are built upon. Um, and we can uh, do more around licensure and program approval uh, and performance assessments to ensure that they reflect the kind of practices that have just been described. One other piece that is important, uh, and this is especially true in states, which where most of this policy is framed, is how to get a coherent set of standards that operate across the whole career and emphasize the right kinds of teaching and learning practices, from what happens in educator preparation through what happens at the level of licensure, uh, early career mentoring, uh, professional licensure if there's a tiered system, and advanced teaching practice. Um, the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards uh, does in fact include standards that are very much focused on these kinds of practices. Um, they have cast some shadow, if you will, down through this system, but we have not tied this together in a coherent way in every state so that the images of what teaching should look like, the nature of learning that we want to occur are very, very clear uh, and reinforced in all of the ways that teachers are uh, developed, uh, assessed, and supported. Uh, Performance-based accreditation is another strategy that some states are beginning to take on uh, where uh, we begin to look at what candidates say, for example, in surveys about their preparedness, about whether they were prepared for uh, these kinds of practices, you know, whether it's practices around inquiry learning, uh, social and emotional uh, skill development for students, uh, practices around um, very thoughtful, deeper learning approaches to content um, teaching, uh, et cetera. And we're using those in California now. Uh, at the point of licensure and at the point of a clear license, which is a couple of years later. Uh, and it tells you a lot about what candidates experience in preparation, and it tells programs a lot about whether they have particular areas where they can improve. Um, performance assessments uh, exist now in a number of states and, again, can be developed and refined to reflect uh, the kind of both equity issues, cultural competence in teaching, as well as the kinds of deeper learning practices that enable students to really engage uh, deeply with their learning. We have to worry about adequately funding teacher education in this country. If you were to become a teacher in Finland or Singapore or a number of other high achieving countries, you would get a high quality preparation to teach completely free with a stipend or a salary while you are training. Uh, the federal government has a role to play here in terms of making those investments, but many states as well uh, in terms of how they um, put money into uh, public universities through funding ratios that acknowledge that it's a clinical profession where we have to develop uh, the kinds of clinical placements and supervision that really support candidates um, and that provide the uh, financial supports for candidates. Uh, professional development school partnerships are one strategy that a number of states and programs have used. Uh, one of the things that really transformed medical education was the creation of the teaching hospital. Now every doctor in the world is prepared in a teaching hospital attached to a university that uh, tries to connect the theory and practice um, in a place that illustrates best practices. We saw this in the programs we studied. They did a lot of work to create relationships with schools where the uh, kind of 
equitable deeper learning practices were illustrated and enacted regularly. Uh, and we need to do that in a way that allows us to get alternatives to so many people coming in without that uh, opportunity. Across the country, we've seen many, many places where uh, teachers are coming in without training. Uh, it's now up to a third of the population of teachers generally, and in some states, uh, even more of the new teachers coming in. And to get alternatives to that, we have to really support the uh, financial uh, pathway for candidates. A number of states are putting in place service scholarships uh, and loan forgiveness so that people can afford to get prepared and then pay it back with service. That is, in fact, the underpinning of the Singapore system. Uh, there's an expectation when you get that free, high-quality training that you will give that back in service um, to the schools. The federal government can play a much more robust role here by improving the um, expansion, to expand the teach grants and other strategies like that. And a number of states are now putting in place residencies where candidates can come in, really get a high quality training, have uh, a salary while they're training, uh, relatively little or no cost for their preparation and pay it back in service, but be in the classrooms of uh, very expert mentors in schools that illustrate these kinds of deeper learning practices. And we describe how that's done not only in San Francisco, but in Newark uh, and a number of other uh, places as well. Uh, there is federal support and in growing state support for these residencies uh, that can enable them to expand across the country. Uh, and I'm trying to get to the next slide, but it's not wanting to go. Okay. And so with those ideas, I want to um, invite Laverne back into the conversation to uh, mediate a conversation with us uh, and uh, uh, viewers about these uh, ideas. Thank you, Linda, and thank you to John, Jeannie, and Sarah as well. That was fantastic grounding uh, in the research and the practices and policy implications. Uh, for deeper learning. And as you pointed out, Linda, um, it's really critical that we think about the broad base of knowledge that we have and examples of how to do this work at the K-12 level. Um, but how, how do we think about um, the implications? And this question is for all of you. Um, and, and just for, for everyone listening, we, we received a lot of interesting questions and comments from all of you today and when we registered. So we'll only have time for a few, but let's jump in with this one. Can you all speak to the steps or ways to build alignment across teacher preparation and school districts? Well, I would just start off the conversation by noting that um, we see this both with leader preparation and with teacher preparation, that when you can get these strong partnerships where uh, you know, you're working both ways, many residencies are trying to do this, but there are some other strategies as well, uh, both universities need to be prepared to work with school districts and schools around um, providing access to a wide range of ways to continually improve practice in the school, while schools also need to be, uh, and districts need to be inputting to teacher education around how to uh, create a stronger theory practice linkage and be sure that the courses are really meaningful, that they're really connected to practice, while both are trying to move practice in the right direction. So it's a very iterative uh, collegial process that's needed. Uh, and we've seen places where this is increasingly the case, but it's going to require um, universities to step out of their comfort zone and sometimes districts to be more proactive in seeing the benefits to them of creating this pipeline that is prepared to practice in the ways that hopefully they're moving toward. Perfect. I think one of the one of the things we saw in the teacher prep programs was a fundamentally different attitude about what the relationship between the partner schools and the university was, and it was uh, it was one in which they felt that uh, this was working in everybody's interest. 
that everybody was learning and developing and improving their practice as a, as a consequence of this relationship. So it wasn't as though that these were just good hearted schools that said, yes, you can place your teachers here. These were uh, places that really were engaged in seeing the university as having resources for them to improve their practice as well. And of course, the universities then had to have a lot of humility, and most of them did, about saying, we can learn as much from these partner schools as they can learn from us. So the relationship is quite different than what's typical. And the question that is coming to the school is not, can we get some classrooms for student teaching, but can we get access to your expertise uh, and to a collegial relationship? to iterate the ongoing improvement of preparation and practice. Yeah, I just wanted to operationalize that a little bit. Obviously, high tech high has a slightly different context and a sort of tighter um, relationship between our schools and our graduate school to begin with. But one of the things that we built in early on that I'm um, really glad somebody suggested to me was we pull the cooperating teachers who host our residents in their classrooms um, their school directors, their principals have to agree to them um, spending six days throughout the year with us, their teacher residency program, um, working together on questions of design and development of the program. And so we pull them and we, you know, we, we help engage them in questions around their particular student teachers growth and so on. But we also ask them to help us tune our courses. Um, we do some course experiences with them and then ask them to think about, you know, well, how do we take this back to the classroom? So there's really that two-way street that you're talking about. Um, and I think there's a sense that they're helping us refine the program design as well as we are helping them better support their, their residents. And um, they love it. I was worried that taking six days of teaching time away from uh, devoted classroom teachers would be a losing proposition, but instead they're, they're asking for more. Perfect. Giles, anything you want to add to this question? I have thoughts, but they're similar to what's been said, so I will save my fire for the next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, terrific. Well, I, I think, you know, it's, all of your points are, are very well taken, and it also makes clear, going back to that coherence point that you were making, Linda, that districts or CMOs then also have to make time uh, to, and, and align their resources and, and operations to support what needs to happen in both schools and in collaboration with universities. One of the other interesting questions that came in, and this might be just a quick one for Jeannie and for Linda, um, is are the study sites for the for the the sites that you studied uh, in your book, are they networked in some way? Um, is, is one of the questions that has come in, and are they learning from one another as well? So you know, we've worked with Bank Street College, which was one of the first seven to create the Ed Prep Lab, and that is a network of now 15 uh, very uh, leading edge institutions across the country that are, uh, in the variety of ways you've described here, um, really tackling this deeper learning agenda uh, and the equity and social justice agenda that goes with it. Um, and that uh, Ed Prep Lab is both sharing practices. Um, it will soon release a, a website where a lot of this, where ed teacher educators can find a lot of information about how to create these kinds of programs. Um, from syllabi and program models to clinical practice models, but also it will be expanding to um, invite other members and affiliates um, into that work uh, so that there will be a way for folks who are doing this tough work to learn from each other. Perfect. One of the other questions that came in, um, SEL was mentioned in the context of, of the various remarks, and one of the participants wants to understand how SEL is integrated into the prep, teacher preparation programs that you have studied. Well, it's in a lot of, it's infused into a lot of courses, often, you know, child development and adolescent development courses, and sometimes courses that are specific too social and emotional learning and development integrated with academics. It's not its own, it's not only a separate thing. Um, and also it's part of the work that the schools are doing, uh, quite often very explicitly around their own curriculum building in the, you know, practice sites. I think one, uh, one interesting thing about social and emotional learning is that um, there are some discrete skills that can be taught, especially with young uh, children, but it's also a lot about uh, culture and the 
nature of the relationships between teachers and students and between teachers and uh, teachers and faculty members to speaking to Sarah's uh, symmetry point. So we've seen a lot of fairly successful social um, SEL interventions that have been about um, particular things, uh, but I think where the field is moving is towards more uh, integrated whole school models like the Comer School model and others. Um, and I think that's very consistent with what we've been talking about uh, with respect to deeper learning. If you want people to learn deeply, you have to build a culture where they're sort of both supported and challenged, where their whole selves are welcome in the classroom space. Um, when we talk about identity, I think that's uh, in part about uh, is my gender or racial identity welcome uh, in this school, in this classroom with respect to this uh, topic? So I think there are some, there's sort of SEL as a sort of distinct field as it exists right now, but there's also the sort of broader question of social emotional learning and the way that it integrates with academic learning. And I think the way the learning sciences are evolving is to show what uh, great teachers and parents have long known, which is that there's a, a really strong integration between those uh, spheres. And so I think getting the sort of tone and culture right at both the classroom level and the school level, level is pretty critical. Sure. Yeah, I, thank you. And I, I think also the other, the other thing I see happening in the field, which I think is so uh, important, is that issues of uh, language, culture, uh, neighborhood context, all these prior experiences actually are a very important part of social and emotional learning as well as an important part of uh, cognitive development. Perfect. Any other thoughts on, on that question? One of the other, other teachers need to bring a lot of cultural competence also um, into the context and um, many schools are also working around restorative practices, different ways of thinking about classroom management and how one helps children develop a community and become fully part of a community and be uh, engaged with each other in respectful and thoughtful and supportive ways. And um, that really requires teachers to develop a certain kind of empathy, compassion, and practices for a classroom environment that um, it's not a separate program that gets shoved in on the side. It's part of the way you think about all the all the work of the uh, community and the school. And yeah, we we um we I don't know if this is just a semantic shift, but we have kind of chucked the the language of classroom management in our program and replaced it with classroom culture and thinking about uh you know what does it take, what does it look like to build and sustain a culture where kids come to agreements with each other about how they. Uh, interact and engage and with their teachers and then how do you sustain that and what do you do when that is uh, when that uh, goes wrong um, and I think to Joel's point it's deeply we, we want our candidates to understand it's deeply interconnected with questions around status the fit between home culture and school culture um, or the lack in some cases how do you create belongingness for all kids uh, what do you do when there are status issues tangled up in sort of um, the, the power structures of our, our schools and our society what do you do when those surface in your classrooms as they inevitably will. Um, and so, yeah, I think SEL, uh, I think it does a disservice to students to sort of treat it as some kind of push-in thing that just lives in the form of like an opening circle in your day kind of kind of thing. Perfect. Um, so starting with you, what's needed at the district level to advance equity, deeper learning, and social justice? <laughs> Uh, that's a great question, and we've been running a community of practice with a dozen districts across North America, uh, U.S., and British Columbia, where we've been working on that uh, question. And so if anyone wants to learn more about that, we wrote up a paper at deeperlearningdozen.org. Like, I feel like a terrible uh, presidential candidate at the moment <laughs> uh, that sort of gives a sort of fuller answer to that question. Maybe we can post that link in the chat for folks who are interested. Uh, the big picture is um, um, a lot of things need to change, but it really starts with a kind of a mindset change. So um, at a really core level, we've got sort of like the federal government telling the states, telling the districts, telling the principals, telling the teachers, telling the students. Uh, what to do, all of which is sort of premised on notions of control. 
Uh, and essentially, we need to sort of reverse all of those assumptions. So good teachers facilitate student learning, but give students some choice, agency, and control in that learning. And so good teachers and good professional learning does the same for teachers, and thus good districts sort of facilitate that kind of growth for their schools. And so if you start coming at it with that mindset that your sort of role as a district is less to uh, like march people towards predetermined outcomes and more towards uh, building the capacity and kinds of experiences that people would need to have at the school level to give those experiences to the students, then a lot of things would follow. You would, in the way that Jeannie was suggesting, you, I mean, the way that Linda was suggesting, you would uh, change the assessments. Uh, you have a huge opportunity in professional development. Uh, both quantitative research shows that professional development doesn't produce much in the way of outcomes. Interviews with teachers reveal that they think it's, uh, I don't know, there's one study which is where the teachers were quoted as saying, not only death by PowerPoint, but we line up to be vaccinated. Uh, so there's a sort of huge opportunity in that space. Um, but really, the sort of most significant shift would be uh, cultural, like could. And so in our community of practice, it's just sort of like one more level to that. When we bring uh, districts together, we try to give them the kinds of experiences that we're hoping that they will give to their uh, schools. You know, we start with tree of life and what are your key values and who are you and what are you bringing to this work? Um, and uh, there's been some uh, there's been some great leadership among our districts. There's also been some pretty significant sort of unlearning things that people had assumed were important that have gradually come to think uh, are less are less important. Others have anything they want to add to that? Well, Joel, yeah, you know, really laid out a lot of the big issues. But if you think about this and what we know from sort of the science of learning and so on and the distribution of potential. You know, fundamental practices like norm referenced, you know, uh, testing that, you know, allocate labels like sort of, you know, smart, average, and dumb, tracking systems that follow that, the ways in which instruction then often becomes very much about, you know, transmission. Uh, you know, I, I tell you something, you remember it, you spit it back on a, on a test rather than being empowered in your learning and developing the many kinds of talents and potentials you have. A lot of that stems from state and um, district policy as much as local school um, policy. So there's a lot of unpacking that has to be done to give teachers the opportunity to teach and teach deeply uh, and to teach in ways that are socially um, equitable and just. Uh, as well as the learning that teachers and school leaders themselves need to do. The major Another. mindset also shift. Go ahead. Were you going to say something, Joe? I was just going to say very quickly. This is a point that Linda has made um, that um, creating ways to retain teachers is really critical. That if teachers keep turning over because of um, the conditions in schools or school leadership then it's really difficult to, no one teaches deeply their first year. Like it's just, you're sort of trying to get your bearings and it takes a while and for teachers to develop, for schools to develop a culture of learning, if the teachers keep turning over, it's, it's really difficult. So one critical issue in this is, uh, is teacher retention, which is in turn created to the uh, kinds of school conditions, which uh, I think was something Linda has been writing about since the 80s, but uh, it's still important. <laughs> Well, I'm, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I will just say it's, what's so clear is the mindset, cultural, and policy shifts needed to apply the knowledge that we, that we have gained through the important work that all of you and others are doing is something that's critical to advancing uh, work in, in deeper learning. Um, I would like to thank, once again, all of our presenters for sharing their valuable insights into deeper learning and the need to build and align systems that advance equity and social justice across teacher preparation in PK-12 schools. I'd also like to thank, again, our partners in the Ed Prep Lab and at the Bank Street Graduate School of Education. Our partners and presenters have also provided some wonderful resources that are available on their websites and are showing on the slide that you're looking at right now and, and links shared in the chat box. Uh, just a quick reminder that a recording of this webinar, as, as well as all the resources we've shared today, will be sent out to everyone via email. We hope you all have a wonderful day, and thank you for joining us.